Hello, my name is Anne Tebo. I'm an Associate Professor of Pathology at University of Utah and a Medical Director for Immunology at ARUP Laboratories in Salt Lake City, Utah. Welcome to this presentation on idiopathic inflammatory myopathies and update on autoantibody testing. Idiopathic inflammatory myopathies, generally referred to as myositis, constitute a diverse group of diseases characterized by moderate to severe muscle weakness and chronic inflammation of the skeletal muscles. Other organs are often involved, including skin, heart, gastrointestinal tract, and lungs. Patients with myositis may present with variable risk for cancer, immune responses to self-antigens manifested by the production of autoantibodies that recognize a variety of cytoplasmic and nuclear antigens have been identified. The first diagnostic criteria by Bohan and Peter in 1975 characterized patients with myositis in three major discrete groups, namely polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and sporadic inclusion myositis based on clinical and histopathological features. Discovery of specific autoantibodies associated with distinct clinical pathological phenotypes has led to stratification of myositis into more categories, notably immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, distinctions between childhood and other onset, the presence or absence of malignancy, as well as associations with other connective tissue diseases referred to as overlap syndrome. Thus, the identification of the correct subtype and the distinction of these conditions from other diseases that have characteristics that mimic these conditions are fundamental because each subtype has a different prognosis and response to therapies. Patients with myositis typically present with muscle weakness, elevated serum levels of muscle enzymes, and abnormal muscle biopsies. However, patients with other acquired myopathies or genetic muscle diseases may have remarkably similar presentations. Making the correct diagnosis of another muscle disease can prevent these patients from being exposed to the risk of immunosuppressive medications which benefit those with autoimmune myositis, but not those with other forms of muscle disease. Some of the most common acquired and inherited muscle diseases that can mimic autoimmune myositis include inclusion body myositis, limb girdle muscular dystrophies, metabolic myopathies, mitochondrial myopathies, and endocrine myopathies. Medical history, physical examination, laboratory evaluation and muscle biopsies can help clinicians distinguish myositis mimics from true autoimmune myositis. For the remainder of this presentation, I'll be focusing on the use of autoantibody evaluation in idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. In recent years, it has become more apparent that autoantibodies have a role in further distinguishing subtypes of myositis patients and clinical serological classifications have been proposed. In addition to diagnosing subtypes of myositis, the presence of specific antibodies has also demonstrated significant relevance in stratifying patients based on risk for certain organ involvement, predict cancer, or response to treatment. In this regard, if present, autoantibodies may be useful in long-term management of patients with myositis. In general, Myositis autoantibodies are classified into myositis-associated antibodies and myositis-specific antibodies. The myositis-associated antibodies such as anti-PMSCL, anti-CU, anti-U1-RNP, and anti-U2-RNP are commonly found in patients who have features of other connective tissue diseases, in particular overlap with systemic sclerosis. In contrast, Myositis-specific antibodies are generally found exclusively in myositis, are directed to specific proteins found in both the nuclear and cytoplasmic regions of the cell, and correlate with genotype and clinical manifestations. Investigations into these specific autoantibodies help classify patients into increasingly homogeneous subgroups, may guide specific treatment regimens, and importantly, increase our understanding of the pathogenesis of myositis. As earlier mentioned, the presence of specific antibodies is thought to be important in defining myositis subtypes. 
Patients with polymyositis are generally characterized based on the presence of autoantibodies that target the amino acyl transfer RNA synthesis, which catalyzes the binding of amino acids to the corresponding transfer RNAs. Of these, anti jo one antibody is the most common. Other less common markers include antibodies to EJ, OJ, PL7, and PL12. In dermatomyositis, ME2 was the first described with MDA5, NXP2, TIF1 gamma, and SAE markers reported more recently. The presence of TIF1 gamma and NXP2 antibodies are thought to occur in higher frequencies in patients with cancer compared to those without. The immune mediated Necrotizing myopathy is the most recently clinically defined subset of myositis and is associated with antibodies that target the signal recognition particle, SRP, as well as the 3-hydroxyl, 3-methyl glutarol coenzyme A reductase, HMGCR, proteins. In the case of sporadic inclusion body myositis, antibodies targeting MOP4 T4 have recently been reported with varying diagnostic specificity. Lastly, Myositis antibodies such as PMCL, Q, U1, RNP have been reported in myositis overlap syndrome. In the subsequent slides, I will focus on polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and immune mediated necrotizing myopathy, which are associated with well described myositis specific antibodies with defined phenotypic attributes. Polymyositis is a term that was generally used to denote all myositis that were not dermatomyositis or sporadic inclusion body myositis. Traditionally, myositis is described as presenting with weakness in proximal muscles that evolves over weeks to months and affects adults but rarely children. Patients are usually positive for all anti-synthesis antibodies previously described and suffer from a constellation of symptoms collectively referred to as anti-synthesis syndrome, which includes myagias, muscle weakness, and a combination of core symptoms, including interstitial lung disease, renal phenomena, seronegative arthritis of the digital joints, fever, and mechanic hands. The table shows the defined anti-synthesis antibodies in polymyositis, their frequency, and the clinical features of anti-synthesis syndrome, which I have described in the previous slide. J1 antibody is the most common autoantibody marker, while the frequency of PL7, PL12, EJ, and OJ are less prevalent. As earlier mentioned, these associations are kind of variable with some core clinical manifestations, which include interstitial lung disease, arthritis, renal, fevers, and mechanic hands. Patients with dermatomyositis classically present with a characteristic skin rash with or without proximal muscle weakness. About 40% of patients may present with rashes without muscle weakness, a condition referred to as amyopathic dermatomyositis. In children, the nail fall capillary density may be reduced and is inversely associated over time with muscle and skin disease activity. Subcutaneous calcinosis of the elbows and knees with at times ulceration often occurs in juvenile dermatomyositis but is uncommon in adult patients. Approximately 15% of patients with dermatomyositis after the age of 40 will develop a malignancy within 3 to 5 years following diagnosis. The most common malignancies associated with dermatomyositis include colorectal, ovarian, lung, pancreatic, and stomach cancers. Classic dermatomyositis rash can be quite subtle. However, helotrope rash is typical and consists of purplish discoloration of the eyelids, often associated with periorbital edema. Patients may also present with grotons purpules, which are red or violet purpules occurring over the knuckles, the interphalangeal joints, and other extensor surfaces. A macular erythematous rash may affect the face, neck, and anterior chest, defined as the V sign, or upper back, the shawl sign, the extensor surface of elbows, knuckles, knees, or toes. At times, the nail beds may have dilated capillary loops with, importantly, periungual hyperemia. 
Reynolds phenomenon, a condition resulting in discoloration of the fingers and of the toes after exposure to changes in the temperature or emotional events may also be observed in patients with dermatomyositis. So this table shows the antibodies present in patients with dermatomyositis, which generally occurs in about 70% of the cases. Me too was the first described marker and it is associated with good treatment response and favorable prognosis. Antibodies to MDA5, NXP2, T1 gamma and SAE have more recently been described as earlier mentioned. Anti-P155, 140 or T1 gamma antibodies are generally present in juvenile and adult dermatomyositis patients with close correlation with malignancy in adult population. NXP2 antibodies share similar phenotype with anti tif one gamma antibodies, except that NXP2 antibodies are associated with calcinosis and severe muscle disease, particularly in children. Anti-MDA5 antibodies are found with high specificity in clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis patients and generally associated with rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease. Although the numbers are still small, Patients with anti-SAE antibodies tend to present with skin disease first and then progress to muscle weakness with systemic symptoms, including dysphagia. In this year's study, reactivity against either NXP2 or T4-1 gamma identified 83% of patients with cancer-associated dermatomyositis. In addition to older age and male sex, cancer was associated with antibodies to NXP2 or TIF1 gamma on multivariate analysis, odds ratio 3.78, 95% confidence interval of 1.33 to 10.8. Stratification by sex revealed that NXP2 antibodies were specifically associated with cancer in males, odds ratio 5.78, confidence interval 1.35 to 24.7. Immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, also referred to as necrotizing autoimmune myositis, is a subtype estimated to account for about 19% of myositis cases, which, prior to the increased importance of histopathology, were likely classified as polymyositis. It usually presents with severe proximal weakness, lower extremity weakness, and severe fatigue. Dysphagia and respiratory muscle weakness are very rare. Statin use, cancer, and connective tissue diseases are the usual associated risk factors. As earlier mentioned, SRP and HMGCR antibodies are the most common markers in this subtype of myositis. HMGCR antibodies were initially theorized to be caused by exposure to statin. However, Recent published literature suggests that some cases are starting naive. In general, patients with immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy respond to immunosuppressive treatment, although refraction is not uncommon. SRP and HMGCR antibody levels are generally associated with creatine kinase levels and disease severity at initial presentation. Early aggressive immunosuppressant therapy has been reported to improve outcomes with risk of relapse high during medication dose reduction or withdrawal. In a number of studies, including these presented, the levels of CRP and HMGCR antibodies have been reported to significantly decline following treatment. Decline in antibody levels do correlate with surrogate disease activity markers such as serum creatine kinase and may be useful in monitoring treatment response. Recognizing the need for physicians to adequately identify and stratify patients with myositis for treatment and long-term management, ARP Laboratories offers several panels for evaluation. The myositis extended panel is comprised of myositis-associated and myositis-specific antibodies for a comprehensive evaluation of these patients. This panel is particularly useful in patients who may present with poorly defined clinical manifestations. For a more targeted myositis subtype evaluation, three main panels are offered. These include panels for polymyositis, dermatomyositis, as well as a combined one for polymyositis and dermatomyositis. Lastly, recognizing the frequency of interstitial lung disease in connective tissue diseases, including myositis, 
a panel that includes a variety of autoantibodies, including myositis-associated and myositis-specific antibodies, is also offered for a more comprehensive evaluation of these patients. Classic and novel autoantibodies targeting cytoplasmic and nuclear antigens contribute to the diagnosis of patients with myositis. Careful selection of these autoantibodies in clinically meaningful panels as well as optimal methods for their detection is essential not only for diagnosis but to estimate prognosis and stratify patients for more personalized treatment and better outcomes. Thank you for joining me on this presentation on idiopathic inflammatory myopathies and update on autoantibody testing.